in 1984, one of the most influential games of all time, which would establish the one-on-one -on -one fighting game genre, was released at the arcades. Published by Data East and developed by Technos Japan, Karate Champ was a huge commercial blockbuster. And a year later became one of the top 5 overall highest grossing arcade games of that period. The arcade cabinet featured a never before seen twin joystick mechanism to control your character, giving you the possibility to do 24 different moves. Unlike most fighting games of today, Karate Champ did not feature a health bar, which had to be depleted to win a match. A more realistic point system was used. If you hit your opponent, you either get one point or half a point. If you score two points, you win the round. Win two rounds and you win the match. This turned the game into more of a karate simulator compared to the one-on-one -on -one games we know today. The game also featured bonus rounds for extra points, which has been copied to death ever since. Karate Champ inspired numerous martial arts games, old and new. John Tobias, one of the creators of Mortal Kombat, cited Karate Champ as the primary inspiration for his game. But it wasn't only the arcades that triggered the martial arts craze of the 80s. That same year, Karate Kid was released in theaters, and every kid in town wanted to be a black belt. Karate games started to invade the family homes. First, it was Data East themselves who released a very mediocre port of their own game Karate Champ on 8-bit machines. This was quickly forgotten when the clones started to arrive. Most notably, Melbourne House's Way of the Exploding Fist, released in 1985, and International Karate from System 3 a year later. Two brilliant 8-bit fighting games, greatly surpassing Karate Champ in playability. Over the years, we've gotten quite a bit of beat em ups on the Atari ST, but only a handful were fun to play. Luckily, International Karate is one of them. Well, to most people anyway, the ST version of this game was very special and unique and didn't look any bit like the previous releases. Why? Nobody knows. Until now. But to tell the complete story of International Karate on the ST, we need to go back to its first incarnation on the 8-bit home computers. Mark Kale, one of the founders of System 3 Software, always wanted to do a martial arts game. The idea was conceived by his partner, Emerson Best, who was a Taekwondo practitioner. Mark persuaded a company called LT Software to do the game for them. They were commissioned to develop International Karate and by November 1985 the ZX Spectrum version was finished and released. It wasn't great, but it did the job. Meanwhile, the programmer for the Commodore 64 version banned the project, leaving a completely unfinished game. All that was done were a few pages of code and some graphics by none other than John Hare, who would later found a company together with Chris Yates called Sensible Software. Now that LT Software was unable to complete the Commodore 64 version of International Karate, Mark had to look elsewhere. One of his relations at Activision pointed him in the direction of a young programmer named Archer McLean, who had released the amazing Defender clone Drop Zone on the Atari 8-bit and Commodore 64. Archer didn't like the ZX version one bit and he thought he could do a way better job, so he rewrote everything from scratch and adapted it in his proven Drop Zone game shell. He redrew all the backgrounds and animations and created tools to animate frames and cue the sound effects to trigger at exactly the right frame time. A lot of effort was also spent at the hit detection, making it just perfect. Musician Rob Hubbard created the legendary soundtrack for the game, which was inspired by Sakamoto's Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence. In the end, it took a whole 6 months to finish the project. USA had first release rights. System 3's partner for publishing overseas, Activision, however, turned the game down. They didn't believe it would be a success in America which turned out to be a huge mistake from their part. So Mark went to Apex, the name was changed to World Karate Championship and released in April of 86, with a release in Europe following a month later. It became the first European game on the number one spot of the USA billboard, and Archer never received any royalties. After the release in the USA, Data East filed a lawsuit against Apex, which spanned over almost two years 
claiming they had copied their Karate Championship code. Apex were ordered to recall the product. The decision was appealed against. When Archer was asked to do a statement for the court to justify nothing was copied, he told the judge, It's a karate game with karate moves, karate outfits, karate sound effects, karate everything. You can't copyright karate. The Supreme Court accepted that and stated that one company couldn't monopolize an entire game's genre. IK was a pure karate game. Rather than wearing down an opponent's health, the goal is instead to score single solid hits. Therefore, matches can be very brief and intense. It also featured minigames, mostly focusing on timing. The Commodore 64 and Atari 8-bit versions by Archer McLean were heavily inspired by Way of the Exploding Fist. But International Karate was faster and more responsive and to this day is considered one of the best fighting games of all time. But by 1986, the Atari ST was quickly gaining in popularity, so it was time for System 3 to enter the 16-bit realm. In the beginning of the 80s, a gentleman named Robert Stein, who had defected from Hungary to the UK in the 50s, created the publisher Andromeda. Meanwhile, behind the Iron Curtain, Reni Gabor led a company called Novotrade. Novotrade would develop games, while Andromeda would find them Western publishers. Robert Stein had a good relationship with Jack Tramiel, who was still president at Commodore. And so, he was able to acquire the first 20 Commodore 64s coming from the production line. Because Hungary was a socialist country, part of Comic-Con and still under strict influence of the Soviet Union, these new machines had to be smuggled across the borders. And because of low wages in Eastern Europe, Novotrade was able to attract a special breed of developers and programmers. Mainly university students with technical studies, mathematicians, engineers and physicists wanted to take a shot in this new industry, since the salary was between 4 to 6 times higher than the salary they earned in their own jobs. So they sent in their storyboards and IDs. Because these people had no prior experience with computer games, they gave a totally new and fresh perspective to the whole thing. A lot of really original titles got developed. And this is how the whole Hungarian game revolution of the 80s started, and Robert and Reni stood at its foundation. Fast forward to 1986. Because of Stein's friendship with Jack Tramiel, the Hungarians at Novotrade were the first teams to start developing on the Atari ST. Mark Hale was looking to bring international karate to the 16-bit machine, and Novotrade was the company he felt most comfortable with. The ST version of International Karate was assigned to two freelancers, Istvan Seri, who would do the programming work, and Zoltan Tod, a graphics artist. Istvan's journey with computers started with the ZX81, where he learned the basic programming language. But it was on the Commodore VIC-20, which his dad got him from Germany, where he started with the 6502 assembly language, creating his first game, an Asteroids clone. When the ST computers arrived in 86, he fell in love with the design of the machine, and programming the 68000 CPU was amazing. When he began working for Novotrade, Ishvan was still at the university. He got to see the Commodore 64 version of International Karate, and from that point on, he had to figure it all out. Both Ishvan and Zoltan were free to create whatever they wanted, as long as it resembled the original in one way or another. The complete game logic of International Karate was programmed in C. Sprite handling and hit detection, however, was done in Assembler. The most difficult part in making the game was the creation of the computer opponent itself. How could it fight? There was no formal algorithm created, and there was no real AI back then, so the whole setup was based on heuristics. After every human action, the computer-controlled character would react according to a fixed set of parameters, like distance, the move used, and so on. While some players did complain the game wasn't smart enough, this was quickly forgotten once they witnessed the look of it all. Zoltan Todt did an amazing job with the graphics. With the simplest of tools, he was able to get staggering results, giving the whole game an extremely vibrant look and a cartoony feel. Everything was redrawn from scratch using the program Art Director, which was also distributed by Novotrade. When Mark Kale saw the end result, he was blown away. This was on a 16-bit machine, and it showed. Even Atari themselves were so impressed they used the game in one of their commercials. Istvan and Zoltan never received any royalties. 
they were paid a fee for each game they made. The duo would continue their journey in Atari ST game development with the incredible conversion of Impossible Mission 2. Later on, Istvan was approached to do an Amiga conversion, but because he was already working for another company, he declined the offer. Amiga fans had to wait till 2013 when Philippe Guichardon reverse engineered the original ST version for the Amiga. International karate on the ST has always been a cause for debate. You either loved it or hated it. It was graphically so different compared to the 8-bit version. I grew up with it and I personally wouldn't want it any other way. But wait, we're not there yet. For SD owners, International Karate Plus was the first in the series programmed by Archer McLean. The relationship between the original and the new release was never really obvious to me, because these games looked so different on the SD. For 8-bit owners, this was way more transparent. The biggest change was the inclusion of a third player. Archer saw other karate games with a backdrop of a dojo with players waiting on the side to come out and fight you. And he played with the idea of each participant to enter the fight when it was his turn and the other to leave. But because of the limited processing power of the Commodore 64, he abandoned this idea and went for a third player. This drastically changed the pace of the game compared to the original. To create the fluid animation of the characters, a rudimentary form of rotoscoping was used. Archer got a backflip from a scene in the movie Grease. He laid cellophane on the TV screen and traced around the arms and legs. He would then use a pixel editor on the computer to first draw the outline of the character. The famous double split kick was taken straight out of the movie Cannonball Run, when Jackie Chan gets in a fight with a group of Hells Angels. The AI of the game was very simple and based on random decisions by the computer to attack, defend or do nothing. The harder the difficulty level, the quicker these decisions were made and the more precise they were. IK Plus only featured one backdrop, but lots of little details were added, like falling leaves, a periscope coming out of the water, and Pac-Man appearing from time to time. The game also featured over 60 easter eggs, T for dropping the trousers of the characters being the most famous. Sound effects were mostly done by Archer himself, recorded in the house, hitting spoons on pots and pans and making crazy noises. But some of them were ripped from the classic Bruce Lee film Enter the Dragon. Archer wrote to Warner Brothers, who owned the rights to the film, and they replied that if the samples were less than 4 seconds, there was nothing they could do about it. The main theme was again composed by Rob Hubbard and converted to the ST by Dave Lowe. International Karate Plus also featured two bonus rounds. Archer wanted to create more of them, but ran out of memory. In the first game, you need to kick bombs on the screen before they explode. But the one that was most fun was the deflecting shield round. This was inspired by a game and watch called Manhole, which was really addictive. Archer tried to mimic this addiction by having a player move a shield up and down. While IK Plus might not be as visually pleasing as its predecessor, it is considered one of the best fighting games on the ST and the Amiga. The playability is just spot on and never really beaten after its release on the system. International Karate was the first beat-em-up I ever played and will always have a special place in my heart. And to me, IK Plus, well, that's the best two-player game ever. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and remember, stay Atari. Bye.